While most of this meeting is appropriately devoted to treatment and how to improve treatment outcomes, certainly treating the wrong patient uh, is something none of us want to do. And um, active surveillance is an appropriate strategy of management for many patients that we diagnose with prostate cancer. So I'm gonna start this uh, presentation with some general comments about active surveillance, which all of us in the audience are probably quite familiar with, and then expanding active surveillance into what we would call not, or what I would call non-traditional populations. Those with high volume disease, even if it's Gleason score six, and those with favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. So certainly not everyone diagnosed with prostate cancer carries the same risk of cancer progression. Um, there are many men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer that simply will live with it even without treatment and never be bothered by it. And while we always want to minimize the harm to the patients that we do treat, I don't think any treatment that we give is side effect free. Um, certainly I perform primarily radical prostatectomy and I would be loath to say that all of my patients get back to their baseline. They certainly do not. I tell all of my patients they will not get back to their baseline. Um, with treatment. And of course, patient selection is the key. We've learned about biopsy techniques on how to identify patients for the uh, approach to therapy, um, hemiablation, focal ablation, whole gland treatment. Um, it should be a risk-based approach. Not one strategy should be used in every single patient. So certainly from the standpoint of risk, we know that there is a large difference between the number of men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer and the number of patients who ultimately die from disease. Now we can say that this is certainly a, an indication that treatment works and works well, but it also points out that many patients just simply won't benefit from treatment. Not everyone requires um, radical prostatectomy, focal ablation, radiation therapy, et cetera, just because they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And this is where active surveillance uh, comes into consideration. And certainly most of us in our practice have active surveillance patients or at least refer them to someone who manages active surveillance. There are a number of studies uh, that support active surveillance, primarily in the low risk patient population. This is old data, but it's long-term data from the PIVOT trial, which was basically um, treatment with either ra with radical prostatectomy versus no treatment at all. So this isn't even an active surveillance population. And you see that in the low risk group, really treatment provided no benefit at all. Uh, so treating patients with low risk prostate cancer up front really provides them with no benefit, only the risks of that treatment. And I, this has evolved over the years. There's been many, many studies that have confirmed this, Lori Klotz with his group in Toronto, et cetera, that patients with low risk prostate cancer are primarily managed um, with active surveillance. And certainly there is morbidity. Um, this is data with surgery. We can include radiation therapy, even focal ablation strategies. All treatments have a risk. Uh, certainly urinary function has changed, sexual function has changed, uh, rectal, um, rectal issues can occur with treatment. There is no treatment that, that is without cost in terms of quality of life for the patient. So as with everything, we balance risks versus benefits. My graphic here isn't that great, but one of the arguments that my patients frequently uh, say to me is that, well, you know, I've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. I'm in my late 50s. I'm probably going to need treatment anyway. Why don't I just get treated today rather than simply waiting? And there have been a number of studies like this. This is from Andrew Vickers, who does quality of life outcomes at our group. And it's really just the effect of immediate treatment, in this case, immediate surgery and its impact on erectile function versus simply delaying treatment. And what you see is that even if you're treated within five years, you preserve baseline functionality for as long as possible. You take the hit in terms of treatment negativity at a later date, and you essentially recover back to similar um, erectile function rates. So delaying treatment, even if it's only for a few years, meaning those men that are started on active surveillance that ultimately progress to treatment, they're still better off. Um, so active surveillance is a good management strategy, even in younger patients and even in those patients who ultimately will require treatment. 
um, you're better off delaying the negativities for as long as possible with a very small compromise in prostate cancer or overall survival. So patient selection, of course, is the key. So how do we do this? Um, so when we have a patient, and this is our general recommendations for active surveillance, basically all low-risk patients at my center and in many centers around the world now are managed with active surveillance. This is not um, absolute. This is not written in stone. This is what we do. It's evolved over the years based on evaluation of our data. Um, we used to do biopsies every year. We would always do a confirmatory biopsy within six months of diagnosis. We no longer do that. Um, if someone has had an adequate biopsy with a pre-biopsy MRI, we no longer do immediate confirmatory biopsies. We don't think that's necessary. And we basically follow this schedule. Patients get an annual digital rectal examination. PSAs are checked um, every six months. Based on those, if those are relatively stable, we won't repeat an MRI for 18 to 24 months. Biopsy is about every three to five years. If the MRI stays very, uh, relatively stable, we'll do a biopsy sooner if there is a change. And we defer treatment um, until there is progression. Now, what's progression is the big question. Um, and I think the pool of patients who are candidates for active surveillance is certainly going to expand. Um, it's no longer simply we find a speck of Gleason 3 plus 4 equals 7. That patient now goes on to some form of treatment. So if we look, and you may not be able to read all of this, but basically all the guidelines that are published include that patients, selected patients with favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer should be considered at least candidates for active surveillance. So it's no longer simply the very low risk patients, it's now all low risk patients, and now we're creeping into the realm of favorable intermediate risk. So I think everyone saw the recent uh, EAU meeting, uh, Freddie Hamdi and his ProTech study, basically looking at what are the benefits of treating patients with prostate cancer versus management. And he had about 1,600 patients that were followed. Uh, it was a randomized trial between surgery, radiation therapy, or close monitoring, not true active surveillance, but close monitoring. About a third of the patients that were followed had either intermediate or high-risk prostate cancer. Um, there was no difference in death, either overall survival or prostate cancer-specific mortality, similar whether or not one received treatment or not. Um, however, there was a difference in um, patients developing metastatic disease, about 10 versus 5%, so you can say it's doubled, uh, but it's still a relatively small number of men that progress to metastatic disease. And again, a doubling, 7% to 13%, in terms of those patients receiving long-term uh, androgen deprivation therapy. So if you look at survival, there's really no benefit to treatment. If you look in terms of preventing metastasis or progression to needing uh, long-term hormonal therapy, there is a benefit um, to um, earlier treatment. These are the curves, they're basically on top of each other. The top one is prostate cancer specific survival, as I mentioned, no difference. And then metastasis free survival, there was a benefit in terms of treatment, albeit relatively small. So the important part of risk groups, even within low risk patients, they're heterogeneous. They're basically big categories of patients. And if you look at in intermediate risk patients, there is a, a, a wide range of risk even within that same group. Um, basically, it's clinically localized disease, PSA is between 10 and 20, and Gleason score of seven. And I think all of us in this audience understand that someone with a Gleason 3 plus 4 equals 7 prostate cancer in one core where the amount of pattern 4 is only 5% has a very different risk than someone who has seven cores of Gleason 4 plus 3, where there's 80% pattern 4. So intermediate risk, it's not all intermediate risk patients should be treated or should be considered for active surveillance. It's the favorable of the favorable intermediate risk. And favorable intermediate risk includes those patients with only 3 plus 4 equals 7 cancer 
or less, a patient with a Gleason 6 with a PSA of 11 is included in favorable intermediate risk. Fewer than 50% of the biopsy cores being positive and really only having one factor for disease. So these are the patients that we would focus on potentially for active surveillance. It's not unfavorable intermediate risk, at least at this point. Um, and it's those patients who have a lower volume of pattern four disease. And that's what really is associated with risk. It's a quantitation of the amount of pattern four. Um, these are data from Toronto. They look at the metastasis-free survival in patients with Gleason 6 that's considered low risk, Gleason 6 that's considered intermediate risk, and those patients with 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3 equals 7. You see that those with 4 plus 3 equals 7 behave fairly similar to those with Gleason 6 with higher PSA levels. So there's something to the amount of pattern four, really the four plus threes are those that do the worst in this particular patient population. So this was one of the first suggestions that quantitation of pattern four is important. This is Jonathan Epstein and his group looking at the, you know, the Gleason grade grouping, the ISIP classifications. And again, the classifications are based on quantitation of higher risk disease. So there's a wide separation between three plus fours and four plus threes. Again, quantitation of pattern four being important. This is from the data from the Martini Clinic who did a quantitation of Gleason pattern four in radical prostatectomy specimens. And if you, this basically, it's broken down into percentage groups. So these are those that underwent radical prostatectomy and had only uh, Gleason score six, but the amount or quantitation of pattern four was significantly associated with biochemical recurrence. So again, the amount of pattern four drives biology and it's the patients with less pattern four that are approaching those patients with only Gleason score six prostate cancer in terms of outcomes. So again, giving a suggestion that these patients may be appropriate for active surveillance. Uh, this is another study from the University of Michigan. Uh, again, a quantitation study looking at the amount of pattern four uh, versus the, the probability of adverse pathology, again, Adverse pathology is in the darker bars, the yellow is biochemical recurrence, and as the volume or percentage of pattern four within the radical prostatectomy increased, then those patients um, did worse in terms of overall outcomes. Um, so again, quantitation is important, volume of pattern four leads to worse outcomes. This was a study done at, at, at my shop with uh, Dr. Andrew Vickers, uh, Samson Fine, is, who painstakingly went through all of uh, these biopsies and basically compared various measures of quantity. So is it percent? Is it linear length? Is it volume of disease versus volume of negative disease? And what they found was the factor that correlated best with outcome was the total length of Gleason pattern four. And it makes sense because a percentage depends on the total length of your core. So 5% pattern four and the core is only two millimeters is very different than 5% pattern four if the core is 18 millimeters. So the linear length is most important. And the cutoff, if you look at these numbers, so this is risk of adverse pathology. This is amount of pattern four. It ends up being about a little less than a millimeter of pattern four within the biopsies. So that is a good sense of, well, these patients with very small amounts of Gleason pattern four, while they are considered intermediate risk, this may be the group that we target for active surveillance. Another factor that we found was important was MRI findings. Now we've heard about the limitations of MRI, but those men who had intermediate risk prostate cancer, favorable intermediate risk, excuse me, who had undergone radical prostatectomy, if they had a negative MRI prior to surgery compared to those men with a positive MRI, PIRADS three or higher, there were higher rates of adverse pathology and higher rates of upgrading had the MRI 
been positive. So again, suggesting that a man considered for active surveillance with favorable intermediate risk, the MRI can give you a better group, meaning their MRI is negative and you simply find, found the uh, three plus four equals seven on a random biopsy. And then the final category is, well, what about patients who have lots and lots of Gleason 6? Um, considered low risk, uh, but basically their quantity of cancer is high. Those men do have higher risks of progression, but still the majority of men will not progress within uh, you know, six, seven years of being placed on active surveillance. Two thirds will stay untreated. So while a man with multiple positive cores of Gleason score six is at higher risk for progression, those men are still very good candidates for active surveillance. Um, this, and the conversion rate is higher, but it's still not prohibitive in terms of considering these men for active surveillance. So what I'd like to say in summary is that certainly risk groups are heterogeneous. Even though they're easy to think about in terms of low, intermediate, and high, within each of those groups, there's a range of risk. Selected men, and it's primarily men with low amounts of pattern four, again, linear length better than percentage, but however one quantitates it, low volumes of pattern four within an intermediate risk group patient uh, is certainly a consideration for active surveillance. A negative MRI is better than a positive MRI, although a positive MRI does not preclude a, a patient from consideration. Of course, PSA density comes into consideration. And I didn't mention this in the main set of slides, but cribiform and introductal histology is a whole different beast. Um, we do not consider those patients appropriate for active surveillance. They have a much higher risk of progression. Uh, but certainly a portion of favorable intermediate risk patients should be considered for active surveillance. And I think that's my last, oh, ongoing questions. Um, Genetic testing. Does a positive, and I'll pick one, Decipher, Pro, Prolaris, one of the other tests, does that mean someone should go on to treatment or should their surveillance just be adjusted to a more vigorous or rigorous schedule? Um, how do we quantitate multiple samples? We've seen from all of the presentations that if we have an MRI target, we typically take three samples from that. Do we add up all the samples? That will increase the quantity of pattern four. Do we consider the worst sample? Um, how do we actually factor those findings into um, determining risk? And finally, what do we really know about pattern six? Is there a threshold over which we should treat um, rather than not treat? So ongoing research, I'm sure a conversation for another meeting. I know that's my last slide. Thanks very much.